This is WNBP Television, nostalgic broadcasting in Philadelphia, broadcasting from the Sears Tower on Roosevelt Boulevard. If you want to have fun, come home with me. You can stay all night and play with my TV. TV is the thing this year, this year. TV is the thing this year. Good day. Radio Rick Spector from Movie House Productions. Welcome to our salute to the early days of Philadelphia television and beyond. Our video is dedicated to Wee Willie Weber, an early Philadelphia television and radio icon. Willie specialized in hosting kiddie cartoon shows, in particular, Breakfast Time on Channel 6. The Wee Willie moment I'll relate to you is a strange one. Wee Willie, every weekday morning, used the services of Elmo Wiffle Weather to bring the day's weather forecast in to his viewers on his high wire. My parents bought me my own Elmo doll set. I planned a house-length journey. I tied his string between our living room antique apothecary scale and the Venetian blinds in the dining room. Maybe fear of heights got the best of Elmo, and he and the scale crashed into our hi-fi, causing major damage to the cabinet. The hi-fi was the prized possession of my elder sister, Marcia, who bought it with hard-earned funds from her sales position at the nearby Roosevelt Boulevard W.T. Grant store. A recounting of the resulting confrontation between Marcia and little Ricky is not for family video, but suffice to say I saw stars. And now, some stars of another kind. Radio was great. Now it's out of date. TV is the thing this year. At the RCA Laboratories in Camden, New Jersey, Vladimir Zaworkin refined his iconoscope, the first practical video camera tube. Philo Farnsworth, the father of all electronic television, perfected his system from his lab in the Philadelphia suburb of Winmore, Montgomery County. Farnsworth first demonstrated his system to the public at the Franklin Institute in Philadelphia on August 25, 1934. Television's growth did not proceed smoothly. There were challenges. Now, friends, I know you'll enjoy a demonstration of my new television receiver. You not only hear the broadcast, but you actually see it on this screen. This is station WX21 making a television broadcast direct from Niagara Falls. Are you ready, Niagara Falls? Let her go. Oh, isn't this thrilling? Philco operated W3XE, one of America's original experimental television stations. Their work on television was halted in the early 1940s for top-secret radar production. In 1941, Philco's airborne radar equipment was used at the Battle of Midway. Philly broadcast pioneer John Lyons recalled television's infantile, creepy-crawling beginning at Philco's W3XE. In 1940, John Lyons' agent had his eye on the emerging significance of television and got jobs for Lyons and his friend Joe McGinnis at $5 a week at W3XE. Lyons wrote scripts, acted, painted sets, adapted plays, and called on his friends to participate. The picture quality was terrible, and the studio was lit by huge banks of lights that literally melted makeup. Philco distributed sets to Philadelphia families of means. The sets were sold on the condition that Philco be given reception reports. The mail-in response was close to 100%. Return with us now to those thrilling days of yesteryear with John Lyons on W3XE.
we now switch you to our affiliates in New York City. Look, Pop, it's a home run. Not last week's game, not something that happened yesterday, not even a minute ago, but right now, seeing things, miles away, at the very instant they happen. That's the new thrill that television makes possible. Dream along with me I'm on my way to the stars Come along, come along Leave your worries where they are Up and beyond the sky Watching the world roll by Sharing a kiss aside Just use your imagination On a cloud of love We'll hear the music of night at the moon as we hold each other tight And if we go in the right direction Heaven can't be very far I'm on my way to a start We can wake at the moon as we hold If we go in the right direction, heaven can't be very far. Dream along with me. I'm on my way to a star. Old Tom Mix, my TV broke, I was in a fix. I got on the phone, called my man, said, get here, daddy, as fast as you can. Philadelphia's Philco Corporation was a pioneer in the development of batteries, radio, and television. After World War II, Philco's experimental W3XE became WPTZ, Channel 3, at 1619 Walnut Street. Meet Harold Pennypacker, who came to Channel 3 in 1946. Penny worked for four decades at Channel 3, from most basic jobs to top executive. Penny did it all in TV's earliest days. He pushed dollies, opened and closed curtains, and operated the cameras. Philco's cameras were huge, three-foot cubes and used four lenses mounted on a turret. The cameraman viewed the picture upside down. Penny's six-foot-four-inch frame was a plus in manipulating these big, awkward machines. WPTZ was first to televise the Mummers Parade. Two cameras were mounted on a tractor trailer. A freezing penny operated a third camera from a city hall window facing South Broad Street. Penny was behind the camera for the first telecast from Shide Park. There were only two cameras, both behind home plate. One camera was positioned in the rooftop press box and another hung on cables for wide angle shots. In 1948, WPTZ televised all three presidential conventions from Philadelphia. 
WPTZ pioneered daytime television. Philadelphia Electric sponsored a one-hour cooking show with Florence Hanford, which became television's longest-running program. There is barely time for a cat nap in those busy days for Penny. Penny televised the Gimbel's Handyman Show, Ice Hockey from the Arena, Zoo Shows, Horse Racing from Garden State Park, and The Flower Show from Rittenhouse Square. In 1948, Penny traveled America to open up new markets for Philco. The local TV distributor would host a dinner party at a hotel or convention hall. Potential Philco dealers, including department stores and mom and pops, would be invited. Penny would telecast a one-half-hour variety show from another room in the facility. After the program, the dealers were introduced to the complete line of Philco TVs, ranging from the 10-incher to the 16-inch projection TV. Once upon a time there was an engineer. Choo-choo Charlie was his name we hear. He had an engine and he sure had fun. He's good and plenty candy to make his train run. Charlie says, love my good and plenty. Charlie says, really rings the bell. Charlie says, love my good and plenty. Don't know any other candy that I love so well. Philadelphia broadcast pioneer Alan Tripp revolutionized television advertising. Tripp's long-running Choo Choo Charlie commercials broke new ground. The ads did not yell at or put down kids, but sold through building character and creating empathy and understanding. As original local and network programming were often in short supply in the golden age, old movie shows abounded. Only back then, the old movies weren't so old. One of our favorites had an air of culture about it. Channel 10's Picture for a Sunday Afternoon, its introduction featuring fine art and classical music. WNBP now pays tribute to some of Philly's stars and programs in the golden age of television. Phil Sheridan was one of TV's first weathermen, teaming with John Facenda and Jack Whitaker in 1950. Uncle Philzy literally created TV happy talk. His legendary easygoing style set the pattern for countless announcers nationwide. Alan Scott, born Alan Schwartz in Philadelphia, taught at the James G. Blaine School in Strawberry Mansion. Dr. Leon Levy, co-founder of WCAU, heard Scott speak at a public meeting and suggested that the dynamic Scott try radio. Alan Scott came to WCAU in 1930 and was considered the enfant terrible of the local airwaves. He criticized Mayor S. Davis Wilson so heavily, the mayor threatened to have Alan Scott fired. Alan Scott was the first local television star to log a thousand appearances in shows like Let Scott Do It, Scott and the Mechanical Man, and Cinderella Weekend. Pete Boyle was a commercial artist for Philadelphia Electric when they began their long-running cooking show in 1947. Pete was so good at telling jokes and drawing cartoons, Channel 3 hired him. Boyle entranced baby boomers with comedy shorts and westerns on shows like Funhouse, Lunch with Uncle Pete, and Six Gun Cinema. Australian Lee Dexter gave up teaching aspirations after he saw his first vaudeville show. Following the show, Dexter went home, built a dummy, and discovered he was a natural ventriloquist. After touring the world, Dexter settled in the United States in the 1930s. Dexter hit the airwaves with his character Snoop the Squirrel on the Lunch with Pete Boyle show. Dexter's most famous character was Bertie the Bunyip, a bunyip was described as part bunny, part duck-billed platypus, along with the shaggy roughness of a collie pup. Dexter rebuilt and restored puppet heads for Edgar Bergen and Paul Winchell. He developed a way of molding rubber and plaster of Paris to allow for greater facial expression. One of Dexter's puppets was so realistic that a Dallas, Texas store guard shot it, mistaking it for an after-hours intruder. I love 
chocolate tea. Chocolate flavored Bosco is mighty good for me. Mama puts it in my milk for extra energy. Bosco gives me iron and sunshine vitamin D. Oh, I love Bosco. That's the drink for me. 1953 through 1954's Action in the Afternoon was TV's only live Western. It was broadcast on weekday afternoons from the back lot of WCAU on City Avenue. Action in the Afternoon was filled with bloopers. Truck tops could be seen above the set on City Avenue. Director Richard Lester, who later worked with the Beatles, played what he termed vanilla music to cover up vehicle noise. Horses chewing on microphones scared the hell out of the most experienced audio men. Willie the Worm starred in Junior Hijinks. The show won a TV Guide Award for Best Children's Program. Said Newton the Mouse of his friend Willie, he's forever telling interesting tales, and it seems he knows about every subject there is. This is because Willie spent four years under the University of Pennsylvania. Let's pretend that it's story time and I'll tell a tale to you. I'll tell you a story of make-believe and all your dreams will come true. And when the story's over and when we reach the end, you'll live happily ever after in the land of Let's Pretend. There was no kinder and more creative children's show host than Gene London. In addition to running Cartoon Corner's general store, Gene co-hosted a Saturday afternoon show with Willie the Worm. This was the only place in town one could watch those magnificent 1940 Superman cartoons, although at the time, we didn't know they were produced in color. The gang had to wait one week to catch each episode, and we placed our Saturday afternoon ball games on hold to do so. Who would have thought long, long ago that you can now enjoy these gems anytime you want on the internet. Bandstand hit the airwaves on WFIL-TV in 1952. Bandstand was one of television's longest-running musical series. When it was picked up by ABC in 1957, it was the first network series devoted to rock and roll. The Bandstand concept originated on radio with WPEN's Joe Grady and Ed Hurst, but the duo could not escape from their radio contract to bring Bandstand to television. Bob Horn came to Philly Radio in 1939 at WIP as special events commentator and program director. Producer Jack Steck brought Horn to WFIL as late evening radio DJ and afternoon movie host. Steck changed television forever by choosing Horn to lead Bandstand. Horn's sidekick was Lee Stewart. The early set resembled a record shop. There was no shortage of kids as WFIL studio at 46th and Market Streets was close to West Philly High and West Catholic for boys and girls. Despite the protest of his regulars, including a teenage Jerry Blavitt, Bob Horn was fired from bandstand in 1956. A succession of scandals involving payola, income tax evasion, DUI and a morals charge from a bandstand regular finished Bob Horn in Philadelphia. Bob Horn began a new life as a Texas disc jockey, Charlie Adams, paving the way for Dick Clark. Last job.
Sally Starr was born Sally Mae Beller in Kansas City, Missouri in 1923. Sally broke into showbiz by winning a Pepsi jingle contest. Sally arrived in the area in the early 50s singing with Bill Haley and the Comets at the Twin Bars in Gloucester City, New Jersey. With her husband, Jesse Rogers, she appeared on Jack Steck's Hayloft Hoedown from Town Hall, a WFIL country western show carried by 155 ABC station. Sally also DJed at Pat Stanton's WJMJ from 2 to 4 in the afternoons. Jack Steck wanted Sally Star on Channel 6 from 5 to 6. Pat Stanton said, sure, if she's more famous, it's better for me. Sally Star entertained 1.5 million kids per day from 1955 through 1972. Sally Starr was fired in 1972 when Capital Cities took over Channel 6 from Triangle Broadcasting. At the time, Sally's ratings were higher than the Today Show and Captain Kangaroo. Sally Starr triumphed over many personal tragedies and remains dear in the hearts of baby boomers. Sally was every mother's most reliable afternoon babysitter. We will never forget Sally's immortal words. I hope you feel as good as you look, because you sure look good to your gal set. Through the night, and WNBP completes its broadcast day. We leave you with this from Harold Pennepacker, whose words echoed the creative spirit of nostalgic broadcasting in Philadelphia. The most thrilling thing in my life was when man made it to the moon. Someone else invented how to get them up there, but we showed it to the world. My television did this, and I was part of it. If you gotta go, go in a Crass Brothers suit. Crass Brothers, 937 South Street, store of the stars.